Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Safari Pedal Show. I'm your host, Abby. If this is your first time here, welcome to the Safari Podcast Zoo YouTube Crazy Thing Wild Bandwagon. It's great to have you. I'm very excited because Trinity Wolford, aka Ox, aka Trend.Wave, is going to be on the show and we're going to be discussing her mix evolution, her journey, audio process, growth, how her mixes and her workflow has evolved over time, and how overall the journey has been for her. And of course, also got to get the advice that she has for new people like myself that are starting out and just kind of get her take on the whole audio slay evolution process and i feel like there's not much more i can add to the intro so so guys please give a very warm safari welcome to this is gonna be a long one trini wolford aka ox aka trin dot wave hello hello thank you for having me abby i thank appreciate it thank you so much for hopping on i really appreciate it before we dive into today's episode let's start with who you are what you do and we'll take it from there as you heard i'm trinity currently i am an assistant engineer at criteria studios that is my full-time day job i also freelance mix freelance record i like to dabble in dolby atmos so yeah that's what i do a little bit of everything respect what got you into audio in general. Ooh, so throwback to probably 2011, 2012, when I was a kid, I loved, <laughs> I loved rap music. And I was like, I, I started writing my own music. I wanted to record myself. So I started saving up my money from doing chores to buy gear. Really basic, like the worst gear you could possibly get, like USB snowball mic, two by two personas interface. Uh, computer on Logic, uh, started dabbling with loops and got into audio that way. But I didn't think you could have a job in the audio industry unless you were an artist. I, you know, in upstate New York, that was never a thing. So I ended up enrolling in college for criminal justice. And then I happened to get an ad like two weeks before I started for a, um, a local community college by my house. And they were doing a digital audio and beat production certificate for the first time. And so I switched over to, to that. That's where I learned all like the technical aspects of things. And I was like, oh, these are all the cool effects that I hear in songs. And that's when I really fell in love with the post side of things. And I was like, yeah, I don't, don't want to be an artist. Not my thing. You know, I still write once in a while. I, I love to ghost write, but definitely switched paths. And then um, I ended up moving to Florida to go to Full Sail to get my bachelor's degree. My first internship was through Full Sail at the dub stage, which is post-production, where I was working on a CNN documentary, and we each had, there was only four of us, so we had different roles, and I was on the sound effects editing for weeks, so like nine to five, just pulling sound effects, and I thought I loved it, absolutely hated it, and it was just like, damn, I thought I wanted to do post-production, you know, and uh, it ended up not working out, because COVID hit, shut down campus, shut down the studio, so I was like, well, there goes my uh, my one thing I had after graduation, you know. But luckily, music studios were the only thing operating during COVID because they were breaking the law because we had a curfew, but they ignored curfews. So I ended up getting my foot in the door at a few studios. Um, I just sent out some applications and got an interview, chose one, worked my way up from intern to part-time assistant, full-time engineer, I was running sessions five days a week and then again moved up started teaching so i would um, basically teach the other engineers and the interns how to run sessions how to operate pro tools in orlando it's a lot of rap it's so it's you have to be very quick very fast in pro tools you need to learn we just had a template so all of our sound would kind of sound the same not one engineer would sound totally different than the other so it was just a lot of teaching how to use our template, teaching workflow, that sort of thing. And then moved up again, did the hiring process, saw the interns that came through the studio. And then again, I moved over to the mixing side. So I took over all of the mixes that came into the studio. I had my own little room and I was just on salary mixing records and it was awesome for like two years. Moved away from that studio, was just freelancing in Orlando out of my apartment, which was super cool because I would just mix like four records in the morning and then 
go to the gym, take a walk, chill, do whatever. Did that for like six months. And then I won the Pensado's Place scholarship. I had to move to Miami, which I'm here still currently. I was like, well, if I'm going to move to Miami, I want to work in, you know, at Criteria because it's one of the best studios in the country. So I applied there, got the job before I officially moved down, which was perfect. Yeah, so I was just working there full time as a general assistant while going to school. After graduating, I got moved up to a full time assistant engineer. So I'm the one setting up things on the technical and, you know, what microphones I want, getting the signal flow, making sure all the gear works, just being in the room, being on standby, adding whatever gear they need. And then I also teach learning time. So if there's nothing at the studio and somebody wants to learn something on staff, they request the basically you get free room time and I'll teach them whatever they want to know. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now. Took a step back from freelance mixing to now being in the studio because I wanted to be like a, a real engineer, you know, because nowadays everybody can get their hands on Pro Tools and everybody's like, yeah, I'm a I'm an engineer. And it's like, all you're doing is pressing three. You know what I mean? Like you got your hands on somebody's template. You don't really know what's going on in the template, but you know how to press three. So it's kind of almost like a dying art to be able to get in the studio, learn the technical aspect, learn all the different preamps, all the different mics, work in, you know, a state of an art studio. And so then one day when I have my own studio, I can know all the gear, what chains I want to use because I want to do kind of a mix, you know, analog and uh, in the box mixing, have some gear. So I kind of wanted to do that. So that's where I'm, I'm at now. That's sick. I didn't know you were like involved on the teaching side. That's so cool. Yeah, that was that was one of my I love teaching and it just it worked out where um, they asked me to step in and fill the role because our last um, tech left and he was the one teaching so he left and they asked me to step up and I was like I feel like I have no idea what I'm doing sometimes but sure <laughs> and then uh, they they sat me down for like a week I just basically hung around with the tech and we did some in-depth training on the studios and was like okay you're ready and I'm like cool so that that helped me be more confident for sure. So yeah, I, that's definitely one of my favorite things about the job is uh, being, being able to teach for sure. So diving into today's topic, guys, we're talking mix evolution, improvement yes. and all that fun stuff. So how do you feel that your mixes have evolved over time since the beginning of your career? And like, what have been some learning curves that have like stuck out to you particularly? Okay, so I guess I'll start with where I'm at now. I feel like I'm able to put a lot of emotion and expression in my mixes. Um, just being more confident now is you kind of hit a point where it's like, okay, this mix is amazing. It's perfect. Frequency wise, uh, balance wise, level wise, it's amazing, but there's no style to it. And that was, that was the main thing when I was at school at Abbey, they're like, beautiful. The, the mix is great. Now add some of your style, your character, and making choices that people, you know, normally would say, oh, that's wrong. It's too loud right here. You know, maybe that guitar part gets too loud, but it adds emotion and style and character. So just being confident to make those calls in the mix. I think my, my biggest hurdle really was learning how to use plugins and learning how to trust my ears. I remember starting out at the studio I was at, I would watch one of my mentors at the time mix and then that evolved into setting up his sessions and importing and learning what colors he used and seeing you know okay he EQs this frequency almost every time why is that and then I would do that but I had no idea why I was doing it so it's really just training your ear and then learning like I at the vocal track I always cut up to you know at least 70k or you know whatever it is I don't know just breaking the norm there's not a right or wrong, but there's some things that everybody kind of does, you know, it just depends on your, the mix engineers you watch. Like Jason Joshua is very different, very bold, you know, through that era of like, fuck, you're rough. You know, some, some people are, I want to match the demo, just improve it. And then he totally breaks it. So just learning your style is uh, probably a big curve of something I had to learn. So yeah, I, I started off very cautious and then I moved to, yeah, fuck the rough, I'm gonna do my thing. And then I moved to, I'm gonna honor the demo. If the artist likes it, I'm gonna honor that and then just improve it. Um, and then adding my flair into it is what I try to do. That's so cool like to hear how it kind of like 
You started here, went all the way, and then kind of like <laughs> fell back. <laughs> you yeah, dialed it. Dialed yeah, it dialed in, back. Blended yeah. it back. It's yes. the mix knob. Yes. You <laughs> exactly the mix knob. Yeah, you can tell. A, I was a big fan of mix with the masters, Pensado's place, and you could see in my mixes who I was watching at the time and who I was probably you know really studying. So yeah, and then you know taking a blend of everybody and finding your place you know that's awesome like kind of like timeline wise how long into your audio career were you like okay this is me as an engineer and this is like my mix style this is kind of how I like hmm. to get things so I graduated full sale in 2020 had no idea what I was doing probably in 2022 because the studio I was at I was getting so many mixes I was getting um like five a day at least like and it would vary like one to five and i'd have a whole spreadsheet and it's two weeks to do the mixes i had to do them all like that was my job you know so that was when it was like okay i have to get good at this and it, it was a it was a blessing because i got very good very quick and i developed my ear very quick so it took about two years for me to get to that point and then maybe three to be like okay i'm confident enough to break the norm and do what I want to do. Sweet. And it's also like, I think it's so important. And like, let me know what you think too. Like, I feel like nowadays, especially with young people like myself too, I'm all like, there's like this like level of impatience, like it needs to be mm -hmm. now. And like, just hearing yes. that, like, this is your job, this is your career. And there was like a certain process behind it. It's so important to say the thing out loud. <laughs> yeah, no, that a hundred percent. I, I see in, almost every single person, people older than me, people younger than me, uh, I think it's a college thing that they just expect to go to school, pay, you know, 80 grand, whatever it is, and then be handed a job and be, you know, be spoiled and be told that they're the best thing ever. And that never happens. And then it's a wake up call. And you're like, Oh, crap, I'm not as good as everybody else in the industry. And I need to learn. Um, and the hard thing is just getting the opportunity to learn like yes you can go online and get you know i forget what the website's called but you can get sessions with stems and you can practice mixing when i get asked that question i tell people to do that and they're like ah oh, but you know i would rather have a client and it's like well dude if you don't know what you're doing you don't want a client to give you the session you know what i mean so it's like it's really just a lot about practice and discipline and taking a step back and allowing yourself to learn um, I see a lot of people with really big egos who are just starting out, who think they're really good. And then they're like, oh, I, you know, I just graduated. You Can, can I show you my mix? And it's like, dude, I, I don't want to hear your mix. <laughs> if you just, I, we went to the same school. I know, I know the style, you know, I know what you're taught and I respect that, but there's a lot more to go. Like there is no, you should never be at a point where, okay, I know everything. Because then it's like, you, you got to change your mindset. You're doing something wrong. Um, you need to surround yourself with people who are better than you so you can learn from them. So, yeah, it's a, it's definitely a, it's a lifelong process for sure. Definitely. And I, I really love and appreciate everything you said. And, like, again, it's just, like, it's so important to say it out loud. It's this generation. It's not, like, a personal thing, mm -hmm. but it's, like, that instant must be now. When that doesn't happen, people kind of go into crisis mode. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I've seen um, one of my classes at Abbey Road, we got to talk to Dave Pensado. And he one, one thing that always stuck with me was that he said it took him 15 years to be a full time mix engineer, like 15 years. And people try to do it in one. You know, I, I was very grateful with the opportunity I had, but to be on salary to mix full time doesn't really happen. You know, so it's like, if it does happen, live in the moment, take it, learn from it. But opportunities for the most part aren't forever, you know, so it's, you just got to keep searching for the new, you know, new things. So I want to kind of build on what you spoke, what you said before about developing your style and that being a big hurdle. Like, are there maybe one or two examples of like particular particular things in your workflow that have evolved for you over time? I have a few things. So uh, for me personally now, I like to get all the mix prep done either the night before, the week before, you know, depends on when your deadline is. But do it when you don't want to work. You know, that's when you put the discipline into action. 
download everything, organize everything, import everything, color code, import the template, do all your auxes, do the rough balance, you know, this attractive EQ, do all the boring stuff when you don't want to work. So the next day when you wake up, whenever your creative window is, you can be creative in that window and you're not wasting the window doing all of the, the boring business side of things. So that was one thing that I definitely implement now. Another thing in my workflow is key thing, I, like uh, pretty much everybody says this, but save automation for the end. Because a lot of people, yes, it's very easy to just add those little dots and then you kind of get stuck because it's hard to move things around. So save automation for last. And I love BCAs. Um, they make everything easy to just do those little tweaks. Less is more. So that's definitely in my workflow now. I don't like to add too many plugins before I get the rough balance because the balance is 99% of it. I see a lot of people, they import their template and they just go crazy with plugins before they even balance everything out. And that really messes everything up, at least for me. So I save the plugins for the end now and then um, try to just strategically use them. I don't just import and then, okay, I'm going to use this one because I use this one on every mix. And then I just pick so I don't have to go back and be like, okay, where did I mess things up at? Because I did too much of something. So that saves a lot of time for me and my workflow. And then of course, always doing a save as or a save copy in before you do anything major <laughs> to each to each step or each new day that saves a lot of time. I love that. And I love like how all these things like guys grab the advice and apply it like such like solid practical things like I love like I didn't think of um, saving a new copy every time there's like a big move and I'm definitely gonna grab that like for my production sessions. Why not buy another hard drive? save yourself yes. tears yes yeah you have the multiple hard drives i just hopped on the the hard drive wave where you grab a uh, velcro strip and you put it on the back of your your laptop so you can just plug it in i have two of them there so then you can just back up to both when you're done uh, you always got to have backup so we'll save your butt where did you get the idea for the velcro thing like i'm gonna <laughs> my Dude. laptop's gonna be a tank <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a full sale thing. I didn't want to jump on the bandwagon. I was a hater for a long time, but then I uh, I was like, dude, I, there's sometimes like uh, I I really want to learn how to produce too. Like as lazy as it sounds, I hate plugging in and unplugging all my stuff. And I was like, okay, well the hard drive thing I can control. I can just keep it on my computer, and that'll be the first step of ending my laziness. So that that's a definitely a full sale campus thing for sure. Everybody does that. One of the classes, they they're like, "Hey, you should do this." <laughs> so I'm stealing this concept, guys. Everybody, yes. we're gonna all go together, buy a shit ton of Velcro. There you go. Five, ten of the little hard drives. It could be the small ones, but like you'll have endless space for your for your mixes. Yeah, the, It'll be yeah. The, the Samsung, I just have multiple Samsung two terabytes. They're like this big. You can get them in different colors. So I have one for my work, which is blue. And then one that's gray for all of my sounds and plugins. Um, as your logic library, you can actually move all of those sounds to a hard drive. Amazing. And I'm going to color code guys. The, car the hard drives <laughs> are colorful. <laughs> it turns out. Yes. Yeah. It does. It does make a sound difference for sure. Does, yeah. For sure. Really I think I need to do an episode like uh, arts and crafts, practical audio arts and crafts. We can yeah, like, uh, I don't know, like I'll get like colorful tape. We can like put microphone. We can like draw flowers. <laughs> we love that. D dude, uh, let me show. I wonder if it will show up on camera, but I, I draw on my, my eye lock. So yeah, my eye locks oh, are colorful. Um, yeah, of course I put my name and uh, number on here. So there's some useful information, but then it's just colored uh, with Sharpie. So stunning. Yeah, for sure. Guys, if you take away any advice from this episode, it's obviously that you need multicolor hard drives. Like, forget what she said about, like, saving mixes. Like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's not important. No. Start drawing on your eye lock. I'm, I'm starting that wave, so. Yeah, yeah. hell yeah. <laughs> also, again, I'm going to do a little bit of a scroll back to what you said about yes. the new engineers, the young people, the young producers. I'm also one of those people um, with all of the, the pitfalls of being in the beginning and I want to kind of dive deeper into, based on your experience, things like that you also want to point out on the note of like mix evolution or workflow evolution mm -hmm. for the for the new people. My biggest thing, and you'll hear this from everybody, but do not rely 
on a template. I think you can rely on a template starting out when you have no idea what you're doing and you need to get something done and you're using it to learn and you're going through each plugin and you're like, okay, this is doing this. I'm going to, you know, set the compression to max so I hear what it's doing and then dial it back so you can start training your ear. But make sure you know how to build that template from scratch because um, I'm a big advocate on um, if you can't build the template from scratch, you shouldn't use it because that means you don't know what the template's doing and you don't know what's going on. You don't know how to use the plugin, so you probably shouldn't be using it. And then once you can build it from scratch, once you know what's going on, once you know, you know, okay, this effect is doing this, you know, this compression is more for just a clear leveling and then this compressor is used for color. It's like, okay, then you can use it and import it and use it to improve your workflow. Um, of course, you know, you can always import your auxes, your drum auxes, your vocal auxes and help with the routing. But when it comes to using a bunch of plugins, you know, tend to teach to stay out of that. Another thing is, you know, being as organized as possible. I see a lot of people that it's like, dude, when you make a Pro Tools session, it starts in a folder. Do not take stuff out of the folder. It's like, you know, if I, <laughs> I'll, I'll come into the studio one day and I'll see like one PTX on the desktop and I'll open the downloads and there's, there's uh, the wave cache and it's like, oh no, like what, what is going on here? So that's another thing. Uh, make sure you understand Pro Tools hierarchy. Just make sure everything's organized. Learn on the tools you have. I, I think there's a big stigma in the industry that's, saying you need to buy the best gear possible. You need to have a good pair of headphones in order to learn how to mix. You need to be in a good room in order to mix. And that's not true. When I was, you know, coming out of full so you have your Mac, you get a focus right and you get some Sennheiser headphones. I hated the Sennheiser headphones. I know they're 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 good. I'll use them to record like I have them back there if an artist comes, but I do not like to mix on them and I learned i taught myself on these apple earbuds and i still reference my mixes in these headphones um because my my apartment sounded like butt and i didn't have the money to get proper treatment and uh so i was like all right i'm gonna just teach myself on on these headphones and um i ended up going to the mix mix with the masters with leslie and he played my mixes like basically you submit two songs and uh, we go around the room, everybody plays their mixes. And when it was my turn, Leslie played my mix. And then he asked the studio staff, he's like, hey, how do you switch the monitors? He turns on the mains, so we're on the near fields, puts it on the mains, turns it up, listens to my mixes again. And he starts asking me how I, how I got my low end to sound like that. And I was like, you know, like, I, I just mix on these earbuds. I don't do anything crazy. And we figured out it's because I can't really hear the low end um, on my earbuds, I boost it to where I can hear it. And that's like the sweet spot. And so everybody was so amazed that I just mixed on these little things. And I, I don't have any studio gear, uh, like at the time. And they're super impressed. So I'm, I'm a big advocate on that. Always ask your artist for references or if they have songs out. Because it's very easy to get trapped in this hole where you think your mix is amazing. And it probably is amazing. But then you go listen to what the artist already put out and you're like, whoa, my mix has way too much high end compared to what they prefer, what they like. So just reference so you can match their style. And um, another thing, I guess, going back to the evolution of my mix, but I always mix with the artist's persona in mind and who they are, you know, just like different genres. Like you would mix rock different than Latin but you would mix like some 18 year old emo kid different than Taylor Swift, you know? So it's like, have their emotion, have their vibe in mind. Uh, when you, when you go to mix, it's, that, those are probably the most important tips I, I can provide. You drop so many, like yeah, man. so many, like, I don't know. I'm trying to find the word, like amazing bombshells in the best way to kind of like sum up the whole topic of like your mix evolution and all the lessons you've learned. I always love to ask mm -hmm. our amazing guests either drop a piece of advice. It doesn't have to be on topic of anything we spoke about, but just like something you want to say to the people or mm -hmm. anything of that sort. Anything of that sort. Yeah. Well, we, we already dropped a lot of knowledge already <laughs> on uh 
on different advices and bombs, but um, another thing I preach is learn to release your ego. There's a lot of people that I've met that get their foot in the door one place, they work their way up one place, whether it's intern to engineer, and then they don't want to leave that place because they see it as some sort of power. But then they're stuck, they're not learning anything, they've hit a wall. So it's like, okay, you need to go to a different studio, start over as an intern again, work your way up and learn how they do things there. Learn from the people in their circle. You know, there's an infinite amount of knowledge and opportunities out there if you learn to release your ego and start over. Because it's not really starting over. It's just you're, you're still having all the knowledge from the previous. You're just applying it somewhere else. In the, at least in studios, you don't, there is no power. Like an intern in, is powerless. So as soon as they get a taste of the chair, they get a taste of any sort of power, they just want to stay there. Um, so just be able to start over and change your mindset on things. If you think you know everything, then it's time to change your mindset, start learning again, researching. And again, this ties back into workflow because the more people you watch, the more people you study from, the more knowledge you get. And then you can implement their chain, their plugin, whatever, their auxes into your template. And that will help your workflow. You know, it, it, it all goes hand in hand. Yeah, I think it, just really just being your authentic self and finding you and maintaining a healthy relationship with your job, you know, if you do it full time, just remember it is a job, you know, so setting boundaries and really remember your why. It all, it all ties into that. And I it love all, how it, yeah. it all is, it's packaged. It's like a Christmas present. It's exactly yes. what it is. <laughs> I love that. So I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge. I of really course. learned a lot. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. I, um, I hope, I, I mean, I'm still starting out, you know what I mean? But I, I would like to, give out information and the knowledge gems where I can and when I can and to whoever wants them <laughs> you know what I mean it doesn't hurt so I appreciate you having me and letting me have this platform for an hour or so no absolutely like that's you know what the show is really about it's about like being able to say I actually don't know everything and like I'm here yep. to to learn and to share so it's like right in the spirit yeah it definitely wasn't as it, super technical you know we can always if anybody has any super technical questions on mixing or whatever like reach out to me or you know whatever uh we can dive into that but yeah definitely the mindset gems are way more important than any technical so and guys i'm gonna link trinity's info all things below in the description so like she won't get lost. That's what I'm trying to say. You'll right, find her. Right, we like just kind of do like a little <laughs> scroll. She's there. Right. I'm there. <laughs>